심장을 심장을 The Foreign Language Film Award goes to a remarkable Japanese film, Rashomon. A woman is raped and her husband is killed. The notorious bandit is the obvious suspect. He even confesses. Everyone gets their say in open court, but nobody can seem to agree on how the man actually died. The four witnesses have a different take on who killed him. In honor of the movie, this real-world problem is called the Rashomon effect, which is what happens when you have conflicting viewpoints. I'm going to tackle two things in this video. First, I'm going to show how Rashomon is the ultimate art film. And second, I'm going to present my theory on who really killed the husband and how it all ties in together. So sit tight and enjoy the ride. Oh wait, there's spoilers ahead. If you haven't already, please hit pause and watch the movie first, I beg you. You don't know what you're missing. And don't forget to subscribe because this video will be here when you're ready. Let's start by asking ourselves what makes a great movie. On one level, it's a sum of its parts. If you have great acting, a great script, great cinematography, sound and music and so on, you certainly are on the right track. If you fall a little short, the movie is still good. If you hit full marks on all departments, then it's a great movie. The Godfather is a great example. An art movie is more ambitious. When a director sets out to make an art movie, his intention is to arrive at a result that's greater than the sum of its parts. How's that even possible? It's possible because cinema is an art form. You can express an emotion or idea or experience through the language of cinema without presenting it literally. Eight and a Half, Chunking Express, Train Spotting, City of God, Breathless, Pater Panchali, Battleship Potemkin, Metropolis, Pulp Fiction, they're all examples of great art films, because words cannot express the experience of actually watching these movies. For example, when Oliver Stone read the script for Pulp Fiction, he thought it was crap. It was only after watching it that he understood it. If you take out Tarantino, there's no Pulp Fiction. When Kurosawa wrote the script for Rashomon and showed it to his assistants, they didn't understand it at all. They thought this was the beginning of the end for their sensei. He was already a powerful director, but the studio treated this project like a newcomer's film. Rashomon not only turned out to be a great art film, but also a very entertaining one. How did it do both? Rule number one, an art movie does not have the license to bore you. As far as I'm concerned, this is the greatest sin in filmmaking. It doesn't matter what genre it is, horror, romantic comedy, action, even porn. You don't have the right to bore your audience. I've seen countless movies where an actor stares off into the distance for an interminable amount of time. That's shameful. Rule number two, the honest liar. Every single great art movie I've seen has a main character who's an honest liar. What's an honest liar? It's a person who believes he's telling the truth about himself. He believes his own lies and tells them convincingly. He's convinced he's honest. Check out the main characters from the movies I mentioned earlier and see for yourself. The characters are all liars not on purpose, but because it's the way they see the world and themselves. In Rashomon, that is amplified because everyone is an honest liar. Even the dead man recounting his story is a liar, imagine that. Why does this work? Kurosawa's viewpoint is, we are all honest liars. We all lie to ourselves at some point. We don't even realize it. Real life isn't black or white, and a good art film is not afraid to tell us that. Rule number three, you cannot be literal. See, there's no harm in being literal. Most movies are literal. Characters talk about themselves, explain themselves to us. Hydra's number one thug. Technically, I'm a thug for S.H.I.E.L.D. Well, then technically you're unemployed. They think aloud. Please be a secret door. Please be a secret door. Please be a secret door. In a great art movie, you try not to be literal. Here's a simple example. If you love someone, you could walk up to them and say, I love you, strong words, full of intent, definitely. But you could also go through an elaborate ritual to express your love without having to use words. You're trying to communicate the emotion inside without saying it or displaying it literally. That's fundamentally what art is. In an art film, you tell the story and let the audience put the pieces together in their head. They need to actively engage in the process. In Rashomon, there's a point where the wife tells us she faints with a knife in her hand and then wakes up to find her husband dead. We bridge the gap in our head based on whatever's happened before. 
we are constantly trying to piece together the puzzle ourselves. However, if you're not prepared to participate for whatever reason, we will feel frustrated. That's why art movies have a bad name. Not everyone goes to watch movies to do work. They just want to spend some time away from the world's problems. It's like a classroom. Some kids hide in the back and they dread being asked anything. Some kids sit right in front and desperately want to be part of it all. But if there's an entertaining teacher, then chances are more kids will be interested. Which brings me to controversial rule number four. Cinema is predominantly a medium of entertainment. You don't go to the circus so the clown can read you a sermon. If you want a more detailed explanation of this, check out the description. Now let's combine rules 1, 3, and 4. You want the audience to participate and the best way to get them to do that is to entertain them first. If I find a movie entertaining, I listen to the message, even if it's something I have to piece together myself or something not relevant to my life at that point in time. I will appreciate the art and respect the artist. But if someone tries to shove propaganda down my throat, even if they have the best intentions, you've lost me. If you lose your audience, they will lose your message. Rashomon is an entertainer first and foremost. It's a murder mystery, an action movie, a thrilling drama, and also briefly a ghost story. At no point are you bored. Yes, the director wants to communicate to us the unreliability of human observation, which is a scientifically studied problem that policemen have to deal with every day. But not once in the entire movie does any character ever say it explicitly. If you're not entertained and you don't get the message, the art film is a flop. All the great movies I mentioned earlier are also entertaining. They don't bore you. They excite you. And at the end, somehow you've learned something that wasn't said outright. If your education or beliefs or background hasn't prepared you for the message, maybe you won't get it, but you'll still walk away entertained. Finally, rule number five. Most important of all, master the medium. If you want to beat Shakespeare or Mozart or Picasso or Kurosawa, you have to be the master of your art form first. If you don't know how to communicate, then there's no hope for you, which is why most art films suck. If you don't have anything personal to say, don't say it. This is the hardest rule to follow, because cinema is so complex. Sometimes you only know whether something works after you've tried it. There's definitely a huge amount of risk involved in experimenting with the art form. It takes a lifetime to learn the language of cinema. Academy's Board of Governors has voted an honorary Academy Award to a man who many of us believe is our greatest living filmmaker and all of us know is one of the few true visionaries ever to work in our medium. Recently I made a video on Dunkirk. Not everyone enjoyed the movie, fair enough, but aren't you glad someone like Christopher Nolan is at least experimenting with the cinematic form? You can't make art films without putting your career on the line. So master the medium and try to entertain your audience first. Make that your priority. Then you have the greatest chance of success in making an art film. After all, to get more than the sum of the parts, you first have to reach the sum of the parts. There's so many things I could say about the technical aspects of Rashomon, the cinematography, the first movie to ever shoot directly into the sun, adding ink to the rain so the camera can capture it, using mirrors to bounce sunlight for that magical dappled effect. Then there's the music, the acting, everything about Rashomon is worthy of study. If you're interested in Kurosawa specifically, check out the video I made on the focal lens he used for his compositions. I was lucky enough to see Rashomon on the big screen 16 years ago, and it changed my life. And it also frustrated me that there was no solution to the murder mystery, no closure. I love murder mysteries. I made a murder mystery feature film myself, so I had to have a crack at the puzzle. Being a writer, I knew Kurosawa had to make sure the story wasn't easy to solve. If the stories are put together haphazardly, he might have made an obvious blunder and it would be plainly evident who's lying. Even the wrong expression by an actor at the wrong moment could give things away. The short story already has the majority of the plot, but he did change things in the final script. For a history of Rashomon's story and screenplay, check out the description. Kurosawa had to construct the actual story first to make sure there were no plot holes, and then weave these other four tales around it. He was a perfectionist, and I had a gut feeling that he might have left us clues that led to the solution. 
so I studied the film to find these clues. What I'm about to present to you was done many years ago to satisfy my own curiosity, and I hope you're mature enough to understand this is not to be taken seriously. So for what it's worth, here's what really happened in Rashomon. In the afternoon, the couple is on their way, where they pass the monk. The route they take is from Sekiyama to Yamashina, and nearing Kyoto you have a forest and hills. The story takes place in Kyoto. The wife is on the horse and the husband carries his weapons, including his sword. Just a little later they encounter the bandit. This would be closer to Kyoto. See how Kurosawa uses the elements. It's a hot day. The film takes place during summer and it was the wind that the bandit blames for whatever ensued. I'll discuss the importance of the elements later on. The bandit has his own sword. The bandit decides to rape the wife. He intends to kill the husband if he has to, but he succeeds in tricking him instead to let his guard down. He's able to tie up the husband. The movie shows us how he did this, but it's his version, and it isn't necessarily how things went down. In fact, I know it's not true. Kurosawa uses elements powerfully and with intent. Notice how the sun shines through the trees, but never completely. The sun and sky represent the truth. In the forest, the truth is not always clear-cut. Notice the bandit looking up at the sky. Why? Or look at the wife looking up at the sky. What is Kurosawa trying to tell us about the sky? Think about the forest and the dapple lighting effect. At no point do you know where you are in the forest. It's already a muddled location. In the courthouse, the composition is in four layers. The topmost layer is the sky. Whenever Kurosawa shows us the sky, the characters are telling the truth. Whenever the sky isn't in the shot, they are lying, even if they think they're being honest. It is amazing how much coherence you get when you follow this clue. There aren't any contradicting details or plot points when you take just the parts of the testimony when the sky is present. It was done on purpose and is not an accident. So when the bandit talks about tricking the husband, the exact sequence of how it happens cannot be believed. The husband might not have been greedy at all, because no one else mentions that aspect of his behavior. All we can be sure of is he was tied up somehow. The bandit returns to her and he's playing with water. Water too is an important signal. In her version, she goes to the foot of the hill near the pond to commit suicide. And in the bandit's version, he drinks from a stream and is caught near the river. Finally, it rains over Rashomon. We'll come back to water later. If you want to see my detailed charts and analysis, I'll publish a separate document with additional notes. You'll find the link in the description. Anyway, the bandit brings her back to the husband and she loses the hat, which the woodcutter finds later. She attacks the bandit with her dagger, but eventually is subdued. He rapes her and the dagger falls to the ground. Everyone agrees on this. From this point, the stories start to diverge. After he has his way with her, the bandit tries to console her and asks her to go away with him. Her beauty and fierce nature draws her to him. She agrees, probably as a ruse to set her husband loose. She had no real intention of going away with the bandit. The woodcutter observes she was crying and the bandit was asking for her forgiveness. He's an honest liar here and misinterprets events. The bandit claims she asks that one of them die because he too misinterprets her signals. And she doesn't mention any of this at all because it's not relevant in her eyes. She thinks she was being clever, but her husband took it literally. She succeeds in cutting the husband's bonds loose with the dagger. There's probably a light scuffle. And here's the most surprising thing about the movie. There are two great fight sequences in Rashomon, in two different stories. Both didn't happen. Neither wife nor husband mentioned the big duel. The woodcutter saw the scuffle and thought the husband put in a valiant effort. At the end, the bandit throws a sword at the fallen husband and he's injured. In the bandit's version of the story, he throws a sword, but we never see it pierce the husband. The bandit tells us, Notice an important detail about the moment the sword is thrown. In the bandit's version, it's his point of view, and we see it from the front. In the woodcutter's version, we see it from his point of view, from the back. Also, in the woodcutter's version of events, we never see him pulling out the sword. But also notice his expression. He's surprised, shocked. Why? He's a notorious bandit who's already killed before. Now see how Kurosawa can add things that are not in the written story? Why is the bandit surprised? Because the husband is wounded. 
and he's not dead. Coming back to our timeline, in her testimony, she cuts his bonds loose, but he looks at her in loathing and contempt. That's sad. She lost her dignity and her husband in an afternoon, and everyone makes her out to be the villain. Unfortunately, it is true today in our modern world. Even the monk nods when the villager says women are not to be trusted. Kurosawa threw that in as a red herring. We're supposed to judge the wife, just as we're supposed to feel sorry for the woodcutter. It's his point of view we're seeing everything from. The order of stories run from woodcutter who represents us to the monk and anchor so we know not everything is made up and the bandit so we know whom to blame and then the wife. We judge her through her body language. Her tears are like crocodile tears. Why do we assume that? I urge you to re-edit the movie and see for yourself. If her story came before the bandits, we would feel sympathy instead. The order makes a difference. Next, we hear the husband's version, which really confuses us. Then we return to the woodcutter, and we hope his version is the final truth. But it isn't. She's unable to take this judgment from the man she loves, and she faints. When she wakes up, he's dead, with the dagger in his chest. She never actually witnessed the murder, and she considers herself responsible. She assumes she killed him. In the bandit story, he confesses to killing the husband, but here's the interesting part. The wife isn't there at the time. She doesn't witness the actual murder. The sky tells us the bandit was lying because if she were there, she would confirm his version. In the woodcutter's version, she's present during the actual murder, but it isn't murder because he knows the husband survived the attack. What really happens is she runs away and faints. The bandit takes the husband's sword and goes for the horse. He forgets to take the dagger. Later, he sells a sword for liquor and gets caught at the Katsura River, which is at the other end of the city. The camera pulls back when he tells the policeman his story, and they both know he didn't fall off his horse. But what the bandit believes is the husband died at his hands. Now let's look at the dead husband's testimony. In his mind, the bandit cuts him loose and walks away saying, but there's no sky, so he was really injured. The bandit didn't kill him. The bandit collects the ropes, an important detail, and leaves. The woodcutter is watching but doesn't approach because the husband gets up. He's injured and in his mind his wife has just left him for another man because he's inadequate. He finds a dagger and stabs himself maybe in the same place he was stabbed earlier. He dies, dagger in his chest. There was no forensics in those days, so we can excuse the fact that a scientific study of the wound would have told us what weapon was used. When the husband's spirit recounts events, notice how he never seeks out anyone specifically for vengeance. A little later, the wife wakes up and returns to the scene. She finds him dead and leaves, delirious. From the moment she's raped, the sun pulsates through the trees and it unleashes a period of stupor where she's in such mental trauma that nothing thereafter makes sense. When the woodcutter enters the forest, the same sun appears. He goes into a zone as well with accompanying music. It is one of the great sequences in filmmaking history, this walk through the forest. You have to ask yourself, why is this woodcutter walking so far when there are trees all around him? Actually, it's something Kurosawa missed, which you'll find in the bonus features of the Blu-ray. The same sequence happens later in the wife's story as well. The same state of mind. Under Kurosawa's spell, we too fall into a kind of stupor and we are spellbound. The wife leaves her husband's body in the middle of the forest. The woodcutter has to tell someone. He can't let the body remain in his place of work. But here's the problem. If he goes to the police, they'll suspect him or the wife. If he tells them it was a suicide, they won't even look for the bandit. Probably won't even believe the wife ever got raped. Surely the bandit must pay for his crime. What if he could take the dagger and blame the bandit? It's win-win in his mind, and that's what he does. There are only two instances in the courthouse where the woodcutter reacts to a testimony. In the first, the monk says, and watch the woodcutter,
What's the woodcutter now? Second. The framing is deliberate. He stole the dagger, there's no doubt. However, there is one detail that is bothersome. Check this out. The woodcutter clearly witnessed everything. What doesn't he understand? That's one thing. Then there's this other thing as well. If all he did was steal a dagger, he should feel proud of himself. The bandit will be punished for his crime and the wife is still alive. But why is he so guilt-ridden? Did he kill the husband to steal a dagger? It's an intriguing possibility. The husband is still alive and can identify him, so why not? Maybe that's why the bandit was surprised. All the husband got was a flesh wound. Why is he dead? The woodcutter clearly tells his listeners that all three are lying. Well, if the bandit didn't kill the husband, the wife didn't kill the husband, and if he didn't kill himself, then only the woodcutter remains. There are two issues with this theory. One, the woodcutter, if he were so devious, would never have mentioned the story to anyone. And of course, there's a sky to back us up. So if that's not it, why is he so burdened by guilt? The woodcutter witnesses a suicide. He could have stopped the husband, but didn't. He will have to live with that for the rest of his life. He doesn't understand his own behavior, which is what Kurosawa wants us to understand about ourselves. It's never mentioned explicitly, but that's the message of Rashomon. To complete the story, the wife stumbles through the forest, even tries drowning herself, but fails. She hides in the temple where she's found. Now's a good time to address the rest of the elements in the story, starting with Rashomon. Rashomon is actually a change from Rajamon, which means city wall's gate. Raja, according to Kurosawa, was the main gate to the castle's outer grounds. The name was changed in a no play in 1420, long before the short story was written. The writer of the play, Kanze, changed it by using sho, meaning life, instead of jo for castle. So Rashomon could mean the main gate to life. At the time of the story, it's in ruins. During the title sequence, we see bits and pieces of it, just like a mystery puzzle. In the last shot of the sequence, we see the complete building, but it's not complete. Just like our story. This is probably why Kurosawa decided to bookend his movie with Rashomon. It's a place where bodies are dumped and a demon is rumored to live there. The three characters are stuck in this hell. They start with death and end with life. They're stuck there because of the rain, which is element number two. Rain is a trap. They're trapped there until the woodcutter pays for his misdeed. The bandit drinks water and pays for his crimes. The wife plays with water, but it's a trap. When she tries to commit suicide by drowning herself, she fails. She must pay by living. When the husband is going to fall into the bandit's trap, we first see a shot of the wife, sitting beside a stream. Water symbolizes a trap. Even the villager running in the rain at the end is due for a comeuppance. Then there's the wind. The wind is evil, a mischief monger. It's what caused her face to be revealed to the bandit. It blows before the husband's suicide, goading him to his doom. And it blows when the spirit returns from the dead. And finally, there's a dagger. Does it exist or not? It does, of course. It appears in every story except the woodcutters. If the sky is truth, the dagger is deception. The confusion starts the moment the dagger falls and ends when the dagger is stolen. It bookends everything neatly. I've added a small excerpt from Macbeth in the description. You'll find it interesting. All said and done, Kurosawa stresses a happy ending. If we are capable of lying, we're also capable of the truth and good deeds. The bandit pays with his head. The husband pays with his life. The woodcutter pays by adopting a child. He's not going to let another human die if he can help it. And tragically, the wife blames herself. But then again... She's an honest liar. If you enjoyed this video and want more, please subscribe now. After you subscribe, don't forget to hit the bell you'll see on the right. 
so that you won't miss any new videos.